Welcome to Russian History Retold, episode 174, Getting Older by the Minute, Leonid Brezhnev. In the last episode, I covered the causes of the collapse of the Soviet Union due to the actions of Yuri Andropov and Brezhnev, and to a lesser extent, Konstantin Chernenko. This time, I'm going to focus a bit more on Brezhnev's time as leader. Before we go there, I'd like to talk a bit about me and my perceptions of the times. When Brezhnev came to power in 1964, I was six years old. Khrushchev was a historical figure in my eyes. Brezhnev was enemy number one, the living, breathing embodiment of an evil system, communism. My parents taught me to hate communists, as did the media of the day. This indoctrination can clouds one opinions unless you allow for facts and other people's opinions to enter your mind. In the over six years of producing this podcast, I've had to learn not to take the party line all the time. Let the facts and evidence lead the way. Am I always right? Well, if you ask my youngest daughter, she's likely to say, hell no. Am I right more often than not? I'd like to think so. So where am I going with this? I believe my opinion of Leonid Brezhnev and his rule, when I first covered it, way back in episode 103, was prejudiced by my indoctrination that he and his fellow communists were pure evil with no redeeming value. I still believe that communism, as they practiced it, was a failed and deeply flawed ideal. Having said that, I feel the need to reassess the error of Brezhnev and give him and the others in power a little bit of a reprieve. This reassessment was brought about by some highly unpleasant facts. As William Thompson puts it in his book, The Soviet Union Under Brezhnev, when describing the time when Khrushchev was ousted in 64, quote, over the preceding 60 years, the country had undergone three revolutions, two world wars, a civil war, the upheavals associated with collectivization and forced industrialization, the Great Terror, the post-war Lesser Terror, no fewer than four major famines, and the political roller coaster ride that was the Khrushchev era. Arguably, the USSR needed a period of relative tranquility. Just pause for a moment to think about what Thompson just said. In what would have been most of my lifetime, I'm 57 now. My family and I, had we lived in the Soviet Union at the time, we would have gone through 14 major catastrophic events that caused the deaths of a conservatively estimated figure of over 40 million people. Probably 60 to 70 would be more accurate. Around 20 to 25 percent of all fellow citizens died. Imagine the psychological toll this must have taken on the people of the Soviet Union, as well as the leadership. We cannot argue with these facts. These are not opinions that can be debated. They happened and greatly affected everyone involved. It is into this framework that Brezhnev, Kosygin, Podgorny, and the others took control of the USSR in October of 1964. Khrushchev's reforms seemingly came out of nowhere at times. Some helped. Some, like the Cuban Missile Crisis, damaged the USSR's reputation. But the real problem was the instability that Nikita's leadership caused. The Soviet people were tired of things. They needed someone like Brezhnev. Under Stalin, the instability lied in never knowing if you were safe or not. From the 1920s to 1953, the Soviet Union was run by fear. Brezhnev and his consensus-driven leadership style would help to bring an end to that. The first example was immediate, and it was how they handled Khrushchev's removal. Under Stalin, comrade Nikita would have likely been put on a show trial after being tortured, then executed if he was lucky. Instead, despite internal pressure, Brezhnev let him retire to the countryside. Gone were the days where you looked over your shoulder. Of course, This only applied to loyal Communist Party members. Dissidents were still harassed, arrested, and sent to gulags or under drop-offs plans to psychiatric hospitals. As Thompson puts it, quote, The leadership would grant senior officials greater security of tenure and a stable working environment. 
in return for which they would respond by performing more effectively. For a time, at least, this formula appeared to work. The modestly improved economic performance of the late 1960s probably owed more to the end of Khrushchev's endless disruptive reorganizations than to the limited economic reforms adopted in 1965. Over the years, however, the search for consensus, for incremental solutions, and for stability at any price became a caricature of itself. Further, as Alex Pravda puts it, quote, the emphasis had shifted from getting there to being here. The communist leadership felt that they had arrived at a place Lenin had foreseen. Now they had to just tidy up the place and make it work more efficiently. For the first part of Brezhnev's tenure as head of the USSR, things were looking up. Economic growth was exceeding the U.S., who was tied up in a costly and draining war in Vietnam. The Soviet military had achieved a feeling of equality and might to the U.S. as well. Problem was, all of the expenditures on the military was draining the economy. As I made clear last episode, the Soviets were quickly running out of cash. Leonid Brezhnev bought stability to his country, but the price he and the USSR had to pay was stagnation and massive corruption. The cadre system became the business model, because there were no consequences as long as things got done, even if the outcome was inferior. The people began to become jealous of the Communist Party leaders and top officials. They saw the benefits of being a loyal communist. They drove better cars, had better food, lived in lavish apartments and other perks. Brezhnev was as bad as anyone when it came to luxuries that others could not even dream of. He was a car enthusiast and loved to speed through the streets of Moscow in his fancy cars, hitting and killing pedestrians on occasion. Once, when he showed his mother his car collection, she was to have said, quote, Very nice, Leonid, but what will happen to you if the Bolsheviks should come back? By his death in 1982, things were going pretty poorly in the Soviet Union, with U.S. sanctions hitting the economy along with a disastrous war in Afghanistan. Also, the general leadership was getting old, with a number of them dying. A joke made its way through Moscow when Vyacheslav Molotov was reinstated to the Communist Party at the age of 94. The Communist Party suggested that Chernenko, then the newly appointed leader, was grooming his successor. I cannot emphasize enough the problem that the aging leadership posed to the stability of the Soviet Union. Brezhnev's cadre system, which rewarded those who were loyal to him with a never-ending safe job, bred contempt among junior members of the Communist Party. But it also stopped innovations from coming out and benefiting society. Not wanting to rock the boat, actually being rewarded for not doing things differently, was to cause an internal rot to take place. Appointing dying, terminally ill men to positions of power was the system that wouldn't be overturned until Gorbachev came to power. When Brezhnev died in November of 1982, his presumptive successors had already died, like the 70-year-old, 79-year-old Mikhail Suzlov in January of the same year, or they were older than the fallen leader like Andrei Kirilenko, who was 76, or Dmitry Ustinov, who was 74. Yuri Andropov, who would take over, was a youngster in comparison at 68. But the leadership wasn't the only group that was old and ill. The entirety of the Soviet system was aged. They all lived and survived the terror of Stalin. All they wanted to do was to survive into old age and die not at the hands of an executioner, but of old age. To better understand what was happening in the Soviet Union in the 70s through the 80s, I think we need to hear from someone who was living there at the time. Physicists Andrei Sakharov and Valentin Turchin, along with historian Roy Medvedev, published an open letter to the Soviet leadership warning them of the problems that would face their country if things weren't changed. Quote, Deeply esteemed Leonid Ilyich, Alexei Nikolaevich, Nikolai Viktorovich, in the course of the past decade, Menacing signs of breakdown and stagnation have been discovered in the economy of our country. Comparing our economy with that of the U.S., we see that ours lags not only in quantitative, but also 
saddest of all, in qualitative respects. We surpass America in the mining of coal, but we lag in oil drilling, lag very much in gas drilling, and in the production of electric power. Hopelessly lag behind in chemistry, and infinitely lag behind in computer technology. As for the use of computers in the economy, a phenomenon that has deservedly been called the second industrial revolution. Here, the gap is so wide that it is impossible to measure it. We simply live in another epoch. The source of our difficulties is not the socialist structure. On the contrary, it lies in those peculiarities and conditions of our life that run contrary to socialism and are hostile to it. This source is the anti-democratic traditions and norms of life that appeared during Stalin's period and have not been completely liquidated at the present time. There is no doubt that, with the beginning of the Second Industrial Revolution, these phenomena have become a decisive economic factor. Problems of organization and management cannot be solved by one or several individuals who have power. They demand the creative participation of millions of people on all levels of the economic system. But in the process of exchanging information, we are facing difficulties that cannot be overcome. Real information on our faults and negative phenomena is kept secret because it may be used by hostile propaganda. Exchange of information with foreign countries is restricted on the ground of penetration of hostile ideology. Theoretical conceptions and practical proposals, which may seem to be too bold, are suppressed immediately, without any discussion, under the influence of fear that they may break the foundations. The top administrators receive incomplete, falsified information, and thus cannot exercise their power completely. Freedom of information and creative labor are necessary for the intelligentsia due to the natures of its activities, due to the nature of its social function. The desire of the intelligentsia to have greater freedom is legal and natural. The state, however, suppresses this desire by introducing various restrictions, administrative pressure, dismissals, and even the holding of trials. This brings about a gap mutual distrust and a complete mutual lack of understanding, which makes it difficult for the state and the most active of the intelligentsia to cooperate fruitfully. In the conditions of the present-day industrial society, where the role of the intelligentsia is growing, this gap cannot be turned but suicidal. What awaits our country if a course toward democratization is not taken? Falling behind the capitalist countries in the process of the second industrial revolution and gradual transformation into a second rate provincial power. This letter was published in Newsweek magazine in the United States in April of 1970. Another look, this time in hindsight, by journalist Vladimir Konstantinov in 1993 gives a different point of view. Quote, but it was not only the publicists of the Leninist school who drank vodka. Vodka glued together in one great monolith all the groups, classes, and nations, living on one-sixth of the Earth's land mass. The elite drank. Publicists who spent their lives singing the praises of the most outstanding class in the world drank, too. So did the class itself. In general, provincial Russia lived modestly and generously. The first time I ever saw a real-life dissident in my life was in the Supreme Soviet of the Russian Soviet Federated Socialist Republic. True, a rumor once raced around our city to the effect that someone in one of the outlying districts had pasted up portraits of the members of the Politburo under the heading, quote, These men are wanted by the police. To this day, I personally suspect that this was done by the members of our local KGB, simply in order to justify their own existence in our peacefully drinking province. Reflecting on those glorious years, to which, judging from the polls, provincial Russia increasingly looks back with yearning. I think that their excellence lay not simply in the permanent presence in the shops of cheap macaroni and eggs for ruble thirty. Rather, the very spirit of the time, its obvious defects notwithstanding, simply met certain deep needs of Soviet man, 
Homo Sovietico, who was, in my view, formed long before 1917. The need for tutelage, for the certainty that you didn't need to think about tomorrow, because someone else had already thought about it for you. So in conclusion, I feel that Brezhnev as in his leadership was a product of the two before him, Nikita Khrushchev and Joseph Stalin. A stabilization of the cadre system spared the nerves of those in power, but it laid the groundwork for corruption and stagnation. He was not the evil man described to me in my childhood, but a man within a system that tried to bring better times for his people. For this we cannot fault Brezhnev, but heaping praise on him at the same time isn't the answer either. Join me next time as I take a brief detour and cover one of the most controversial characters of the Soviet era, Trofim Denisovich Lysenko. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Before we go, though, I'd like to ask those of you who have enjoyed the podcast to think about going to my blog site, www.russianrulershistory.com, and making a small, or if you're so inclined, large donation to the podcast. Any amount will go a long way in keeping the podcast alive for years to come. And when you go, you'll be able to read the transcripts of past podcasts, beginning with my coverage of Vladimir Putin in episode 170. And every week I'll be publishing another one of the episodes, so that way you can see and read what I just uh, recorded. So now, as always, Das Vidanya Ispasiba Borshoya.